Does anyone want to have the YouTube chat thing on the side? I'll ha I'll, I'm trying to get it open right now. Okay. No. There's a link to it right here if you got if you need it. Oh, perfect. All right, let us know when we're good, Mark. I like think we're good. good. We're it's live. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to League One Fun. Jeff, take it away. All right, guys, welcome back. Second episode. We made it through the first one. We got a lot of fun stuff coming up. It's, it's going to heat up here. Uh, so hopefully if you listen to it and it's still freezing cold, so if you're pretty much from the middle of the United States to the, to the Atlantic Ocean, you're going to be cold. We're going to warm you up here. Um, as always, so far, it's uh, I'm Jeff. We have Mark, Jason, and we got actually a special guest on. He's going to be continuing on with the show here, Chris Ashley. Chris, how about you give an introduction, leave the people know what you're about. Yeah, excited to be uh, jumping in with you guys. Uh, my name is Chris Ashley. I'm from Greenville, South Carolina. Um, so I cover the Triumph uh, partially for a website called Soccer and Sweet Tea and partially on a podcast called Yeah, That Soccer Show. So excited to jump in with you guys as well. Welcome, welcome. Glad to have you. Uh, so as we started off the last show, we're going to start off this one with some player signings. And we're going to leave Marco because uh, he went from having no one on his team to just a team to having a few players. How, how does yeah. it feel to have some players on your team now? You know, it, it finally feels real. I, I was half expecting us to go into that first game with uh, no defense, no attack, no midfield. And so we've got two of each now. So uh, we're feeling good. A couple of them uh, were names I've known before. A couple of them I know were played in uh, USL last year, and then there's one I had never heard of, and so it's always exciting to get to this point of year where you get to learn about uh, all those new guys. Yeah, one of the guys returning, that's, is it Mashe Perez? Is that how you say his name? I've heard it Mashi and Masha, and so I'm not 100% sure. I'm going to go with Mashi, um, but yeah, Mashi Perez played – for uh, SC2, someone they were in the PDL. Uh, he lit it up. He's a great uh, attacking midfielder. He likes to move uh, over to the left sometimes, but that presence uh, right at the top of the box, you know, he can hit a shot from distance, um, and he's got uh, he's got a good eye. And so we're really excited. He, he was one of the guys that some of the Phoenix fans knew about, and we were half expecting him not to be available to, to see him maybe go up to USL. And so to get him down at uh, C2 is going to be great. Nice. Yeah, when I was looking up, uh, you know, I saw that uh, when he played for, for you guys in 2017, he had the CRF International MVP Award um, and some of his college stats pretty good. Looks like you know, definitely a familiar face, which is always good, and definitely has some good stats behind him. Oh, yeah. And then uh, another name, it just actually got announced yesterday, was uh, Cody Wakasa. Uh, and he played for uh, Phoenix Rising last year, the last two years, actually, as a kind of a right back, right mid. Um, and so we're really excited for him to come back and stay in that system. And I think that's one of the great things about uh, the Rising Tucson partnership or any of the other partnerships in the league is you're going to be able to see guys who are familiar with him down, but they always have that chance to come back up. Definitely. That, that's, that's one of the cool things, you know, about – the USL and about the different partnerships that we have. Um, you know, we can see guys moving around. Hopefully, uh, you know, everyone moves up, but, you know, even as they get older and things of that nature, there's, they can always uh, give some teams some leadership and definitely still uh, be useful. Um, so Jason or Chris, I know that uh, kind of had a one-on-one -on -one with Mark there, but any, anyone want to chime in on, in any of those signings, uh, anything that we didn't mention about FC Tucson, anything like that? 
Yeah, Chris, you want to jump in and talk about yeah. uh, Andrew Wheeler? I know we both went and saw him a couple times here in Atlanta. So, yeah, uh, Andrew Wheeler, Amanu is uh, he got drafted by Atlanta United from Harvard. Uh, I have seen on social media through his time in Atlanta, he's a very gifted singer. Um, but the few times he's actually come in and played for the first team, he's actually really impressed um, in that midfield, that defensive midfield, even um, back at center back. So he's, uh, I think he's a good get for this level. Honestly, I'm kind of surprised he's uh, he's uh, dropped down to this League One level. I think he's really a probably a championship level defender, central mid. So I think it's going to be a really a really good pull for Tucson there. Yeah, and he's he's extremely versatile. So when I saw him, he played a couple of games for Atlanta too, um, and they put him everywhere. So I, he was at in the back, in the midfield, um, very good at overlapping, sending in crosses when he had to go up the field. So he's not afraid to take the space. Um, I did see him for a game in Atlanta, or it was in Minnesota. Um, they brought him in on the first team. Uh, it was uh, in the 78th minute. They were down. They were up 1-0, but down a man. Um, LGP got a red card. So you know to bring him in on his first game, defending you know a man down a 1-0 lead. That's truly really big uh, for him to come in. And I think also, you know, he trained with the first team for most of the season. So I think that experience is really something that is going to bring. Uh, that's going to help this team, right? This is something that where he got to train every day with. Miguel Almarone, Joseph Martinez, you know, some of the biggest offensive players, you know, in this country. So he can bring that down and, you know, tell them what those guys are doing and kind of help out, you know, the, his teammates right now in Tucson and saying like, hey, you know, these are the drills we ran. This is how Miggy starts counterattacks. This is how we do this. So, um, yeah, like like you were saying, I think, um, you know, I'm shocked to see him um, in League One too, but I'm excited to see him here. I think he's going to be a uh, – great player that can, you know, pretty much be plugged in anywhere on the field for any system. Nice, nice. Uh, Mark, I was, was so on the notes. Um, now, now, I missed it on social media and things like that, but the uh, trialist for FC Tucson uh, was scrimmaging against Minnesota United and sporting Kansas City this week. And was winning. Right? Winning. winning and was winning. At one point, they went up 1-0 on uh, SKC this morning, and then, you know, SKC kind of got back, and I think it was 5-1, 6-1, 6-2 at the end. Um, but, yeah, they, I mean, that's great experience. Even if they're, it's just for the trialist, that, that's great experience. And to, to see some of those guys play at against higher-level competition will really, uh, I think, tell the coach uh, if, they're, if they're prepared for League One. And... If not, then, you know, obviously the scoreline didn't, didn't work out. And so I can't imagine too many of those guys were uh, impressive. But at the same time, most of the FC Tucson guys are with Phoenix right now in Phoenix. And so not none of the signed guys were down in Tucson yet. Uh, and so there's still a lot to look forward to. Definitely. Uh, so, so, Chris, since you're new on the show here, here's your time to shine. Uh, All right. Green, Greenville has a, has a signing. Uh, how about you tell us a little bit about, about the signing? And Yeah, we actually uh, we got two signings this week, um, Cameron Saul and Sammy Gadiri. Um, Sammy is a guy that uh, there's not a lot of info out there on him, as I found. Um, he, has, he played last year with Sima Aguilas down in Florida, um, one – one goal in 13 appearances, but he is, from everything I can tell, they, the Triumph listed him as a midfielder, but he's listed a lot of places as a, de as a defender. So I think that's probably why he's not uh, so much on the goal scoring ability. He's played a little bit in Germany and actually his connection to the Triumph, uh, John Harks had run into him when he was over trialing with uh, Derby County a few years back. So that's kind of the connection there. And then Cameron Saul is the other player that got signed this week, a midfielder coming out of Lenore Ryan university played the last two summers with Asheville city in the NPSL, which is when I saw his name, I immediately knew who he was just from covering uh, Greenville FC down here last season. Cameron is a pretty versatile player. I mean, they can, he can play everywhere 
And his stats for Asheville City last year are actually a little bit skewed. He got hurt and was listed on the bench sometimes just for needing numbers. But he is a guy that uh, he can really – he's a he's a versatile goal scorer. He, he describes himself as a creative attacking midfielder, which is – when you see him play, that's pretty spot on. So we're excited about him. That's great. And I, there was uh, there was some news that uh, we'll get to a little later in the show about um, some some rivalries that they were trying trying to force. Um, <laughs> at least coming up, we'll get that we'll get to that a little later. Um, uh, but Jason, Jason, you want to talk about about uh, you yeah. guys? Yeah, so let's uh, first and foremost, I, I got a couple of DMs, which now you are making me regret keeping open that uh, we didn't give Texas enough love last week. So I do want to go ahead and, and point out some uh, players and shout out Texas. So uh, North Texas SC named Eric Quill as their head coach, played in the MLS, um, or I'm sorry, played in MLS. We can't call it the MLS. Um, <laughs> Previous technical director of the Texans uh, Houston Soccer Club um, in, in charge of player coaching development, which is obviously the type of person that they want as they look at this as their academy team. Um, former assistant coach of the U.S. national team for the U15, 17, and 19 levels um, and went to University of Houston. Um, so he's a he's an all-around Texas guy. Um, he, I think, is a very, very good signing for what they need to do. He came in and said that he knows that his job is to get these guys ready for the first team. Um, so he's coming in already knowing that, hey, I need to get these guys ready. So if they're called up for an open cup match or even in regular season, they need to be there. Um, I think that he he knows what he needs to get done. He knows the agenda. Um, and so, yeah, I'm excited to see how this team plays because, you know, Dallas kind of has that reputation of having the strongest academy in MLS, right? And they've had high profile players signing with Bayern Munich and they've had Weston McKinney. And so, you know, we'll have to see uh, how this works. A couple of players that I did uh, want to point out uh, Ronaldo Damas, he's a Ford for the Haitian uh, U20 national team. He was a former FC Dallas Academy player, um, a clinical finisher, right? He's not a um, fancy, smancy, ball on the on his feet doing tricks he's just there he's kind of more like a Wondolowski type right he always just seems to be at the right place at the right time is always in the box to you know receive a rebound or a header or a perfect you know across but a lot of times people don't realize when you're that type of player it's because you are being a smart player you are making the right runs you are making the right you know you're positioning yourself at the right time you are reading the game well um so I think that's important to have. And if he's going to be, you know, their their striker up top, I think that's going to be fun to watch. He scored uh, 12 goals in just 13 games with Dallas' U19s. Um, so this is going to be an exciting player to watch. And then another player I think is going to be exciting, which kind of went under the radar. They didn't really – they announced it on their Facebook. I didn't see too much on Twitter or anything. But uh, Alfusani Jada, who is referred to as the Gambian Pogba, and the reason why he's referred to as this is because he's only 19 years old, but he's 6'2". Uh, so he's wow. a big guy. He's very skilled on the ball for his size. And he likes to come back to receive the ball. He wants to be the guy that is going box to box, gets the ball, and starts the attack. Um, very skilled. Watched a couple of highlights of him. He can have two defenders on him. He's not panicking. Um, one thing he loves doing too is long passes, right? He he has great vision and he looks to see who's making the run. He looks to see if the winger is going to be able to make a run down the line. Um, so that's something that I'm looking forward to. He was in the Czech League last year and he captained the U20 national team for Gambia during the uh, World Cup qualifiers in 2017. So this is this is a baller. Um, this is somebody who's also playing in their senior team. He was playing, um, was named in the senior team last year during the African Cup qualifiers. So this is somebody, uh, he's on loan for a year, but it is somebody that uh, I'd be curious to see if other teams, either in USL Championship or MLS, uh, take note of him and try to uh, scout him before he has to go back to Czech Republic. Well, wow. what was that name again? Al Fusaini Jada. And I think you're just doing that because you want me to say it again and say it wrong. So thank I, you for that. No, I, I, don't it wrong. 
Great teamwork. Uh, Great synergy we got going on here. Trying to get you some more DMs. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. Well, I was when I heard about the coach signing uh, and then saw everything that he was doing, that's definitely uh, a good signing for them. You know, as you said, Texas uh especially Dallas has, has a great uh, development academy um, and everywhere he goes it seems to be great development uh, I think that he the, the U18 uh, P, uh, club that he coached um, won the championship in 2017 so you know it's definitely a, a good signing to, to have them uh, coming in and hopefully getting uh, top talent maybe still in some talent from uh, the Western Conference, but uh, yeah, that, I, that'll be... I think it's a good way for them to not lose talent either, right? I think yeah. it's like now they the, the idea of this is you have these kids who are almost good enough for MLS, but not quite. They didn't have a USL championship team, and so other teams were taking notice of these kids and they were getting them, right? You have these kids going to Europe. They're not profiting like they should have. Like imagine if they would have profited off of Weston McKinney, right? This, these are the things – that this team is going to help. It's going to get these kids playing in consistent games. And a lot of things too that I think that I like about League One is with these academy kids, you have these 17, 18 year olds playing against grown men, right? It's a challenge for them. They can get bored playing against other 18 and 19 year olds if they're more talented. But now you're playing against 25, 26 year old grown men with experience who have, who are more physical, who might be bigger. This is the time for them to actually get a dosage of what moving up to a higher league is going to be like what it's going to be like to have a disadvantage and so I think this experience is great for them and I think because of that there's going to be more uh, kids that are going to want to be playing uh, for the academy in this league there's they're going to get more attention and they're not going to get you know taken away from other academies or other teams um, while they sit on the bench I think that's probably one of the most important parts about this team yeah, and that, that's definitely one of the things that I enjoyed about the restructuring of uh, of USL is that it seems like one there's there's a more straightforward pathway that we hope we see people come from USL League Two all the way up to Championship, and hopefully all the way into MLS or European clubs or you know wherever that top of the road takes them. Um, and then this is just one example, and, and hopefully more clubs follow suit. Uh, so so Chattanooga. And let me, Chattanooga Red Wolves, because we give a lot of, we, we <laughs> give some love to CFC. And when, I feel like at this point, it might just be the League One Fun Show and Chattanooga FC Show. Well, it's a definitely, definitely spicy soccer show. I can say that. <laughs> we could, we could talk about that later. Um, <laughs> it, uh, but, but, I don't know if you want to get into it about their recent signing. Yeah, I'll go ahead. Uh, so they had, Tony Walls, a defender, um, really good signing for for them. Um, uh, in 2012, you know, he was the uh, 46th pick in the supplemental MLS draft by the Chicago Fire. Um, for 2014 to 2016, played um, for Rochester, won the championship with them, and then last year uh, played with uh, St. Louis FC. Um, his he had something ridiculous, like 82.2 percent, or almost 83 percent pass completion in 2017. Um, a really great defender, uh, and then the fact that you know he came from uh, St. Louis FC that that's one a loss for them, but you know a, a great thing for Chattanooga to come in. They're definitely trying to build that team to, as, as I think we talked about last week. It's it's all or nothing this year. Uh, and that's definitely one of the signings that's going to help them out with that. I can actually chime in if you guys can hear me. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, I, and Phil, I, we can hear you. I, I was just about to tell him how you said that this guy's the worst. So I don't know if you want to elaborate <laughs> oh, on no. that. I know, Tony won't, me. <laughs> I know Tony won't listen to this, but uh, I can't have him thinking that. Uh, I think that about him. Um, now, like St. Louis passed on on Tony, actually. And so I was a little surprised. And I was also really surprised that like weeks went after that um, and no championship side picked him up. So. Um, he's a really quality guy. He's a really quality player, just like uh, Jeff you were um, <clears throat> listening to because uh, I didn't even know his passing percentage, completion percentage was quite that good. 
And that's not just coming from center back either. He was playing uh, center mid or right back, um, sending a lot of balls forward and um, moving it out of the middle of the field. So he's a really good player. His his number one position, well, first of all, he can play lots of positions, but his number one uh, greatest thing that you can have on your team for him is uh, that he can play multiple positions. So he can play defensive midfielder. He can play center back. His first few games he was playing um, right center back in a back three which is perfect for him because he's pretty mobile for a center back um and he's he's big he's not tall but he's big and he's really great in the ball as you guys were talking about and um the other weird thing was when he got hurt for several games last year and then when he came back we were desperate for a right back at st louis fc and he came right in in the starting 11 immediately and i was worried i was like man i don't know if he's that mobile um but he really never got beat around the edge and he's also really good 1v1 so he was able to pull off a position he didn't normally play really well for us so he's a really good player to have on a team because you can throw him in anywhere he's going to do really well especially in league one he's going to kill it a couple goals even so that's yeah. nice too <laughs> like like you told me the worst yeah yeah the worst he's terrible <laughs> like i just you know, basically said right <laughs> Phil, I know that you said that, you know, it took a couple of weeks and then no one ever signed. Like, do you think that's just that the teams are trying to figure out who all was out there and then go from there? Or, you know, I mean, he seems really good and I don't know, you know, it, it just seems sort of sort of odd that no one else would would pick him up. I'm with you, too. I mean, I can I can guess like he is 29. I think he's got lots of good years in him. And last year he was hurt like maybe half the season. So maybe that's it, too. But if I'm um, if I'm a GM for a league one side, like you got away with some good stuff here. Yeah. There's a risk of perhaps another injury, but he's only been injured for more than a couple games twice in his career. And uh, the guy plays indoor as well. So maybe that's it. Like they're worried about how many minutes I really don't know, but he's a really good pickup for league one. And I think maybe that's something, I think maybe you stumbled onto something there that maybe um, he's a championship level player, quality player, in my opinion, and maybe he was waiting around to see if he'd get another offer and he didn't. And he was like, okay, I'm going to sign with the Red Wolves. So maybe there's a few players, maybe there's a lot of players out there that are waiting for championship to, to work out. And little by little, they may trickle down to league one. I just wonder if maybe that's happening. It's possible, right? Yeah, that's always possible. And we'll find out because uh, league uh, championship starts a week or two, uh, at least a week or two before, mm -hmm. uh, League One does so. You know, there's always possibilities that we'll have some some people that just didn't make cuts and come down, just, which is which is great for League One. It is, and and it I think we'll see like a domino effect because once MLS kids start getting released, right, the super draft guys that don't make it on an MLS squad, well, then all these guys who didn't get a championship spot are gonna be like, okay, screw it, let's go League One. We're not gonna try to take out these super draft young kids. So. Yeah, I think I think we may see like a domino effect of all these people signing to lower levels than they than they were hoping for. But that's kind of the beauty of having a new uh, professional league in the country that some of these guys that, you know, last year at this time would be going back home trying to figure out what to do with their lives. And now they're they're getting a chance to to try and uh, impress and, and move up the ranks a little bit. Most definitely, man. It's it's a really cool thing we've got going here in the USL, and uh, it's only going to get better, right? The more and more teams, the more jobs there are out there for these guys too. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so one last one that at least I know of, um, Jason. You as you were talking about pretty much every team there. I think that you, you know, I, I don't really think that, that you have a favorite team. I think you're just trying to smooth I'm, everyone, listen, wait I'm, to the offer, I'm, see who I'm gives you the most things. You're like that uh, that all that five star hey. all American recruit. See who of gives course. you the most. Yeah, no, I'm I'm all about players, right? You uh you show me personality, you show me hustling. I'm I'm a fan of players. All right, I'm not gonna choose teams. And uh one player that uh got signed this week for Lansing, uh Pato Botello Faz, which automatically a fan based off the name alone, right? You got you got three names in in your full name, I'm with it. Um played at St. Mary's killed it there won the heartland conference uh, player of the year and offensive player of the year um he scored 39 goals and 15 assists in four years uh it was just a straight beast um watching him play uh he could potentially play as a false nine because of how good he dribbles um he's one of the, he can put him up top 
or he can be the person that's in between the box and midfield that can then dictate what happens, right? He he's a bigger guy. He's six foot. Definitely got some meat on his bones, which I like. I don't. I want my guys physical. You know, if I'm going to be a fan. I need you to be able to hold on to the ball. Um, and he he sees the field very well. Um, he knows when to make through passes. He knows when to make a run. Uh, he does a great job of just dictating the offense around him. And I think that's something that holds more value than just scoring goals, right? You can put a striker up top, he can finish. But if you have a player that's able to dictate and understand what's going on around him, understand to know, okay, now I need to make this run or understand to, or know that, okay, I need to come back to the ball because we're not able to get anything going forward. That's the kind of players that you want to sign. That's the kind of players who make a difference uh, when the game's not going your way and you need someone to turn the tides. So I'm really excited to see him. Uh, one thing about uh, Coach Nate Miller, uh, he's he's been hinting, and from what I've seen, an aggressive pressing style of play, uh, which A, is always fun to watch, but B, also um, – makes you think about the type of players you want to sign, right? Is this the play that fits in my system? Uh, so it'll be uh, curious to see uh, how he uses Pato. Like I said, he could be up top. He can be a false nine. Um, but I'm excited to see him play. Yeah, I'm excited. They're coming, uh, playing the Riverhounds March 3rd. So between uh, he and, and Stevie uh, St. Uh, did, we, did we determine it was St. Duke? St. Saint, Saint Duke, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, I mean – I'm excited to see them play. Uh, I think that'll be the, the only time I get to see a, a, a League One team. Um, but that'll be interesting. Speaking of preseason, though, Richmond Kickers released their uh, their preseason schedule uh, the last couple of days. Um, so they're playing six games, I believe. Uh, the first one looks like it's going to be against um, Virginia Commonwealth University. Uh then they're also going to take on Bethlehem Steel FC, um, Old Dominion University, which that should probably be a good game. Um, and then the University of Virginia, and I know that I'm not great at math, but that's four teams. There's still two that I'm somewhat missing, so if anyone knows the other two. They're playing James Madison and then VCU again. Ah, VCU mm. twice. So I like all it. All college teams, huh? Yeah, and let me ask you guys this. Except, how except you, for the steel. How do you feel oh, about... I feel like an academy team now. I feel like... I, I remember... I think it's Lansing that's playing a couple MLS teams in their preseason, and I know Tucson is. How do you guys feel about teams like Richmond going all college and USL compared to other teams that are stepping up and playing some MLS caliber teams? I, I think it depends. Uh, like... Tucson has it easy because the teams are coming to them. You know, there there's six or eight MLS teams training in Tucson uh, for preseason. So, I mean, you don't have to go very far to get those games. And I think it'd be different if they were in any other city. Um, so, you know, I, preseason results don't matter anyway. So, I mean, as long as the team's coming together, you're learning your concepts, you're understanding the fundamentals of, of what your coach wants, I think, no, A, results don't matter, but B, I don't think who you play matters either. I think there's a there's another thing to be said, too. Like, as I'm thinking about Greenville, you know, one of the issues we run into is, particularly now, we don't have our permanent stadium yet, so we're renting a facility. So, therefore, you're kind of limited a little bit on what you can do in terms of hosting. You probably already got those contracts out. Um, so, you know, I think that's something in the, in the future where they could, I know they've even mentioned they would love to host something similar to what Charleston does with the Carolina challenge cup, you know, yeah. bring some teams in, but you've also got to remember you're starting later and a lot of the teams, you know, the USL championship teams and the MLS teams are going to be doing their preseason probably a lot earlier, um, than the league one teams are going to do. So I don't know. I mean, I think, I think it's okay. I think you're probably you probably get better competition against collegiate players. You're probably more on par with uh, with what you're going to be playing against in League One than if you were to step up. I mean, obviously, it could go the other way. You could you could try and swing above your weight class a little bit, and hopefully that would make you better. But I, I don't have a problem with them playing college teams. 
Yeah, I, I know that you know the last few years that um, when when the Riverhounds would have uh, their preseason, it would be mostly against collegiate teams, and I think one of them, like even though we have our own stadium, I think it's one is. Uh, the, the schedules of the other teams, like, uh, you know, well, for us, the, the closest MLS team would be uh, Philly or Columbus. I think Columbus is a little bit closer. But, you know, just the schedule of the teams, um, you know, when they're available and when they're not, things of that nature. And then I know with uh, some of the other teams, besides the training in there, you know, they're having a, a partnership, like Madison is, is having a partnership with, with Minnesota. So, you know, it, it's it's kind of in there that like okay we're in a partnership we're going to have at least one scrimmage whether it's open or closed you know whatever it is mm. you know, there, there's partnerships put into it um and then also you know this is really a trial run year for for everyone so they can look at this year and be like okay well how do we feel we did against this competition and then as the season is ending and as the off season goes in they can be trying to figure out if the teams that are getting their stadiums you know can be looking around for other players as well, or other teams to scrimmage against as, as well as, you know, trying to make schedules work. Yeah. And, and on that same topic, um, St. Louis FC used to play more MLS teams in, in preseason in the first few years they were around. And the last time we did it was with Preki and we played like three, I think in preseason and that we haven't done it since. And I think one thing the GM said was, we found ourselves having to defend an entire game like too much. And we, we felt like throughout the season, that was one reason, you know, you, it's not the only reason, but one of the reasons we weren't so solid in the attack from the get go. And so last year, St. Louis FC played a few college teams and a few, a couple USL uh, championship teams. And this year it's going to be mostly championship teams and maybe one, I think they're, they're playing forward Madison, one league, one team. So, um, you know, I can see it both ways. I wish they would play like one MLS team just for the fun of it and the challenge of defending, you know, uh, throughout a game like that. But, but I, I see all the, all the points of view in that regard. It yeah. seems like it's also kind of a year one thing where, you know, teams will be, be better prepared next year. There, there's so much work that still has to go on just to get this season started. And so, preseason might even be a luxury for some of these teams in terms of scheduling and getting teams yeah. to agree to play or even having enough players to, to play in a <laughs> <Yeah>. preseason. <laughs> and, and you know what the number one cost for any soccer team, even probably maybe even the pros, maybe even uh, MLS, I mean, is travel. It's the most expensive mm -hmm. thing, you know? So you, if you got to play a bunch of Virginias, if you got to play a bunch of local colleges to save money, then, you know, God bless you for being here and, and going pro and paying players and doing all the other things you're doing to be in league one. So I understand. I get it. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that that's all that we have for signing a preseason news. So do we want to talk about the rivalries and some spicy soccer or do we want to tease everyone with them? U S open cup. Hmm. Hmm. Mm. You know, I think it's uh, I think it's spicy <laughs> soccer time. That's doing that, it. That's what I'm thinking. You know, I've got, I've gotten a couple of tweets about it, and a lot of people listen. We're 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 not going to talk about Chattanooga FC, to my knowledge, all season. But uh, a lot of people are asking, you know, what's going on. So I will quickly run down what's going on, and then the latest drama that was announced this week. Uh, so very quickly, uh, the first nail in this rivalry, in this coffin, whatever you want to call it, was GM Chattanooga FC's GM, Sean McDaniel, had left Chattanooga to go be the GM of the Red Wolves, right? So that already gave the, the fans and you know the supporters of Chattanooga FC a bad taste in their mouth, right? They're outraged by this announcement, and then the person that was leading them is taking off to go be the other team's uh, new mom's boyfriend. I don't know, but it's uh, it, it's not a good look, right? And then Tim Hankinson comes in when they're announcing the Red Wolves and their branding and everything. He's the head coach and technical director. And the one of the first things he says is, quote, I have to give a shout out to the Chattahooligans so they know that they're just as vital to this team's success as anyone else. 
as if to kind of like throw some shade to say like, hey, like, hey, we see you guys, but you know, you're just important. Like you're you're giving us the publicity we need. And so obviously that right there was going to be back and forth, cats and dogs. And then the Red Wolves continued their shadiness by signing Gregory Hartley, who was a former CFC keeper. And that was their first signing. So I can understand this back and forth, right? And so then now we have two new developments this week. The first one, uh, which it, it's kind of he said, she said, so you don't, you can't get too much into it. But the financials came out and apparently there was unauthorized payments that went to the GM, Sean McDaniels, or Sean McDaniel, while he was with CFC. And now he's the GM of the Red Wolves. So now CFC is like, hey, you guys can have the corrupt GM. We don't want him anymore. You see what he's done. And Red Wolves fans are retaliating, saying that the reason why he took out those unauthorized payments was because he was actually never paid and he was loaning out his own money or whatever. It's back and forth. Uh, Sean came out and said that it's inaccurate information and it would be dealt with privately, which uh, boo, like I, I want to see it front and center. <laughs> Call him out. Let him know if it wasn't you, who was it? Right. Where where'd the money come from? Why didn't you get paid? Um, but we, I think the bigger age match. Yeah, exactly. Well, we might get it because I think the bigger announcement this week was that uh, Chattanooga FC announced that they're going to be playing a friendly against Detroit City in Chattanooga at the same time as the Red Wolves' first home game ever. Hit that and track. That, that, that is, yeah, track. <laughs> that is, that is wild. That's that is so absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that might be that might be a haymaker because a you're obviously saying okay we already know we've got the supporters we've got the backing we are willing to show up and show you guys out on your first game ever to which is supposed to be your most hype game you know statistically supposed to be one that draws you know the most crowd for the year unless you you know make the playoffs or the cup so they're saying all right we're, we're going to stick our chest out and we're going to show you and then they're doing it against another team who's just as popular as them in the mpsl if not the most popular team in mpsl right so they're showing like hey we're giants too y'all are small fish in this big pond but we own the pond so I'm I'm excited. I love it. I love spicy soccer. This is I feel like beneficial for both leagues. This is something that I hope continues. This is it's exciting. I proposed the thought that each team should send a fan with their flag to the other game, like college game day. You know, just be waving the other team's flag at the at the opposite team's game. Yeah, me me and Phil actually discussed that. Um, one of us would go to. CFC stadium with a Red Wolves jersey and another one would go to the Red Wolves stadium with the CFC jersey and we'll see uh, who makes it, you know, we'll see who lasts longest. We both might not make it, but, you know, we'll text back and forth to see who's still conscious. Hey, man, if there's anything I learned in grade school, it's that I could take a beating. <laughs> I'm a band nerd growing up, but uh, yeah, that'd be a lot of fun. The only thing I want to get a little serious for a second. And uh, so far we haven't seen any like legal action taken on anyone. You know what I mean? So that's the weird part to me is like, if any, any of this really happened, I don't know if we would just be like dropping Twitter, you know, dropping tweets and, and saying things. I think there may be like lawsuits and things happening. So that's something to watch for in my opinion. I don't know how you guys feel about it. For sure. Yeah. I think if it's, I, I think if there's enough there, there that, you know, just with as as contentious as this whole breakup has been between Sean and CFC, I, th I think you're right. I think it, there would be, if there was enough substance there to pursue it, I think it would be pursued. Maybe yeah. it will. We'll see. Yeah. I screeched it to a halt there, guys. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> this is you want to talk about rivalries. This is this is how you do it. You're not even in the same league, but it's still uh so still the spiciest thing in the league right now. We also now know who to go to if there's like any type of drama. I, I don't even think it has to be soccer related drama. If there's like any drama, Jason has the oh, yeah. entire rundown. No matter what. I live for spicy soccer. <laughs> 
<laughs> I don't drama. I, I don't I don't uh I don't argue on Twitter, but I will instigate. That is something <laughs> that I will definitely take part in. So please don't please don't go back and forth in my mentions with other people because I definitely will uh get bored at work and try to try to poke some people and see where it can lead. <laughs> Hey, if Netflix wants their next great soccer documentary, yes. they better be sending their crews to Chattanooga. That's all I'm saying. I, I do hope somebody is capturing this. Someone is. I like that CA just said USL div divorce court with Judge Jason. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> there you go. Uh, don't tempt me. I'm going to start coming in here with a robe now. Don't, uh, don't <laughs> gavel too. Yes. All right, so with uh, some US, some League One rivalries here, uh, there, were, there was an article on League One uh, that was essentially stating that Greenville and Southern Georgia are the rivalry. Now, it's we haven't even started the season yet. Most player, most teams don't have like a full roster or exactly you know, who their rival is going to be. But being that, that Chris... Uh, is from Greenville and Jason, you know, you're, you're down from uh, around the Atlanta area. Uh, is this really like the rivalry? Is this the one we should be looking at? I mean, I, here's the thing. I saw the, I read the article. I feel like we're in America where for some reason, rivalries just have to be a thing from day one. And, you know, I, the, the crazy thing is when Atlanta United got started, they, there was a lot of flack about manufacturing a rivalry with Orlando, but ultimately like that played out and became a thing. Um, I think the thing with Tormenta and the Triumph is actually that the two front offices have been really close. They've worked together. Um, I know the Triumph have really looked to Tormenta to kind of, you know, as they, because they're starting from ground zero Tormenta was the first team in the league. Greenville was the first like new team to come into the league, the third team overall. So I think there's a little bit of that. Hey, let's let's get this thing from the ground level. Um, and I do think it has a chance to be a good rivalry just because geographically it's the two closest teams in the league. There's a lot more likelihood that you know Greenville fans could travel to to South Georgia. Jo Tormenta fans could come up here, um, but. I, time time's going to tell. Honestly, if it's me, one of the things as a Triumph fan, I'm more excited for our potential rivalry with forward Madison because I think from a league-wide standpoint, I think those two teams seem to be just killing the branding. They seem to be out there a ton um, on social media and stuff where some of the other teams are, yeah, they're active on social media, but it's just kind of a different tone. So I think that the just – that, to me, I'm more excited about Triumph and Forward Madison, even though we're way across the country from each other. Yeah. If you guys haven't checked out any of the social media sites for any of the teams, one, go do it. And then second of all, if you're stuck in the snow or the cold and you want to leave a little bit of a laugh, look at Forward Madison's Twitter. They measured the it. snow <laughs> by how tall it went on the Flamingo, and I think eventually it did cover the Flamingo. Full mingo. Full mingo. Full mingo. Full mingo. There we go. But yeah, it, the, the social media aspect is definitely going to help play a key there. Um, and Jason, I know that you are a drama guy. I know. I, I know what you're going to say. Like not, it's not just because I have the notes and I know relatively what we're talking about, but I know that you're going to say Madison and Ignite are the teams that we have to watch out for. That there are the rivalry, hands down, winner. Don't even talk about yeah, it. Listen, they, you know, we, we talk about, I think a lot of the rivalry, like you said, I think the league, league one is forcing this Tormenta Greenville rivalry, right? And that already sets it to where a lot of fans are going to like, like, um, like you were saying, and it's going to be like, eh, I don't want to be forced to rival. I want something to happen between the players. I want something to happen between our front offices. I want that to form. And I already kind of see it with Lansing and Madison, um, you know, First and foremost, you have the proximity, so they're not that far apart, right? They're they're both up there, somewhere out in the cold, you know, trying to stay warm inside right now. But I also one of the things I think it really matters when it comes to rivalry is the fans. And I think Lansing and Madison right now both probably have the two strongest and well put together supporter section, right? So you've got the assembly line in Lansing; they do a great weekly column, getting to know the team 
uh, players and putting out weekly articles, you know, so that you can get to know what you're doing. And then you've got the flock who's already putting uh, meet and greets and other events in Madison and you see the back and forth. And then you also have Dean Trailways, which is going to be providing transportation to Lansing or for Lansing fans to Madison on June 1st for the game. I think this has a foundation stronger right now than Tormenta and Greenville because this is already starting organically from within the fans. And that's how a true rivalry starts, right? You get to those games and the fans are just pumped to see them go and that gets the players going. And then that's when you have some late tackles and some little back and forth going. That's how you really get a rivalry. And, uh, you know, I know that the league is putting four Tormenta and Greenville games and Lansing and um, Madison only have three, but I'm listen, this is what I'm, I'm with this one. I think that this is the one that people should watch for. I think with Lansing's uh, style play, if they are going to do that aggressive pressing type style, it's going to be fun to watch. Uh, it's going to be physical. It's going to be, it's, it's set up for them to have the most exciting rivalry in the league. Mark, uh, any, any opinion on that? Anything in the, uh, in the Western teams you think that potentially could uh, put a foundation down for, for rivalry? Well, I definitely think the two we've already mentioned would definitely be the, the top two for, of course, the, re the reasons explained. I think also I'm thinking about like North Texas OCB being a potential rivalry. And just because those are those are guys that are fighting to get up to next level. Some of those guys might already know each other. They might have played against each other even in MLS at one point. Um, and so I think one, once these teams get on the field, that could be one. Uh, that could blossom, uh, you know, un a little under the table and uh, not get noticed until maybe there's a big boom and uh, you get some action. But I, I'm excited about those two. I think, you know, out here, FC Tucson is going to struggle. Just creating, I think once a team maybe in LA, maybe uh, in Utah gets started, maybe we can have that closer bond uh, just for the fact that we can travel. Um, so that first year we'll be hanging off kind of on the side, watching everyone else beat up each other. Well, if you talk to CFC fans, there's already a team from Utah in the league. They're just in <laughs> Chattanooga. Mm. So wow. Maybe y'all could be rivals. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. I know that we teased uh, some U.S. Open Cup. Um, Chris, from Yes. I know that, uh, that you might have some inside scoop for us. The man with the I have, sources. I have sources. So the U.S. Open Cup account tweeted out today to be on the lookout tomorrow for a big announcement. A lot of USL League One teams kind of jumped in and started responding. Um, and I have it on good authority that they are going to be announcing the format for this year's Open Cup tournament. So we'll know when USL League One is going to jump in at what point in the tournament and really what, at what point all the teams are going to jump in. Um, I'll tell you the, the big thing to watch tomorrow is seeing how many uh, League Two and NPSL teams get in because that is going to – you want to talk about spicy soccer? That's going to – pretty sure that's going to burn the internet down tomorrow because – with League One coming in, obviously, as a professional league, all these teams are getting in, so that's going to be, uh, except for the two teams, obviously, but that's going to create less space for some of these other teams, and uh, yeah, there's going to be some fired up people tomorrow, I believe. Quick quick uh, question. You guys got five seconds to answer. Who makes it furthest in the U.S. Open Cup from League One? Mm. Mark, starting with you. Uh just based on what we know now, it's what we know now. I think Chattanooga. Okay. Jeff? Ignite. Mm. Chris? I'm going to say Tucson. Oh. That was, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> well, will Tucson be allowed to play? Um, oh, you know what? You're right. Last year when yeah. they were in the PDL. Uh, yeah. Okay. I don't think they're going to get to play because of, of the Phoenix – yeah affiliation so in that case i'll say richmond mm. throwing the curveball i like it there we go 
All right. Do we guys, uh, I know we had some Twitter questions come in. Do we, we do. want to get to that? We do. We, we definitely should. Thank you guys for all the love and support you that we're getting on, uh, on Twitter. Uh, I, uh, it's been amazing so far. Uh, so the first one's from Alan Underwood. He asks, what cities or geographic regions would you like to see join League One? And only if there's an excuse to travel there. So we can have <laughs> legit ones. We can have ones where, hey, we just want to go out and see them. Um, Mark. Yeah. Should we combine this with the second question, too? Because I think those two relate. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. I think two yeah. birds, one stone. Yeah, sure. So uh, the second question came from Zach Leishner, uh, which asks, which five current existing clubs would you like to see join USL League One at some point? So we can mix those two together. So top, top of the list for me, I don't think it'll happen, but uh, Real Monarchs um, coming out of Salt Lake, I think would be a great team uh, to come down. But I do think last year they kind of transitioned less – from an academy team to a more professional, older veteran team. And so depending on where they think they're heading, uh, as far as the Monarchs, I think they'd be a great team in League One. I just don't see it happening. All right, all right, Jason. Yeah, so I'm, I'm in between. I want to see the league go after markets to where there's not a lot of representation, right? I know that with USL um, two coming, you're getting a couple of new places that are finally getting professional teams in their market. But, you know, like let's you look at the map. Let's look, look, look at the Midwest. Right. Let's look at, you know, even the southern of the Midwest down in Nebraska. You look at Boise up there. there there's fans that I see constantly on Twitter begging for teams. Right. Begging to have, you know, a community and a professional team that they can go see. So while I like that, um you know, there are going to be some USL championship teams that come down and it'd be cool to see somebody like a Tulsa come down to have a proximity to where you can kind of get those, you know, away games and rivalries going on. I would love to see the market go towards, you know, Boise and Nebraska in that area. Yeah. Yeah. Chris, I'll leave you go before I, I chime in. Yeah. I, I think, uh, I think just for travel sake and for spreading out the country, like I would obviously love to see some more West coast teams, particularly maybe even in the, uh, Pacific Northwest. Uh, I would love to see teams coming down from USL championship if they have a two or a B after their name, just because I think that's probably, you know, I, th I think if you're going to differentiate the championship level on the league one level, that would be an easy way to do it. But in terms of teams that aren't necessarily already out there, in the USL, USL ecosphere, I would love to see some of these lower division teams that have this already have this following that maybe are looking to step up to another level. Uh, a Bug Eaters FC out in Nebraska, a Minneapolis City, you know, a Providence FC. It, some of those teams that kind of have this uh, this big following across the country already. Those would I think that would do really good for the league as a whole to bring in a recognized, established brand from a lower division up to the pro ranks. Those are all really good shots, Chris. Those are awesome teams. I love the idea of like some of the best branded teams getting into League One because, uh, yeah, we're seeing Madison doing so well. There's so many other clubs doing just as well with, with branding and, and cool looks with kicks oh, and things. Yeah, Motorik Alexandria, too. That's another, that's another shout that I should give. <laughs> uh, yeah, so... I mean, I agree. I agree with everyone. You know, definitely some Western teams, uh, some some middle, some middle of the states teams. Uh, you know, and I think that in the next couple of years, as we see the ten mystery teams from Championship League that could potentially move down, I think majority of them are going to be uh, the the B or the two teams. Um, but also, uh, since we're going to say, yeah, since I'm going to do it off the, if it's just a visit there. Um, if 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 uh, Las Vegas could like move down to League One, just like the wild <laughs> of it, like, I, mean, I, I don't know how many people actually take the team seriously. And like I want to, uh, USL League One is definitely a league to be taken seriously, um, and, and we can see all the supporters and things of that nature. But if we just want to put some more drama into things, wherever Vegas goes, there's going to be drama. I mean, with the, between the llamas, and I think they. They dropped some money in the middle of the field for season ticket holders or something last year. Like, 
Plus, I mean, we get to go to Vegas, and it's probably not going to be cold and snowing, even if we end up going for preseason. <laughs> it's a it's a league to be taken seriously, but it's also a league that brings the fun. I mean, look at you, we talk about what Forward Madison's doing. I mean, the name of the show, League One Fun. Like we, that's what I kind of hope League One becomes is the like. Let's not get into the the crazy spicy soccer all the time. Like let's 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 be a league that celebrates just having fun too. So, can I shout one more? I think uh, Baltimore uh, needs a mm-hmm. team. They've never been able mm-hmm. to really fully support a team over a length of time. But um, the, the times I've gone to that city, I've just loved. And I, I think that'd be a good place. I'll agree with you on that one. Anything I can get closer to me, I am definitely good on. Uh, so Ben Goshorn asked us, and I, what is what was the most surprised player that we see come to an L1 club? Um, and I think that we've we've talked about a few that we were surprised, um, you know. And whether it, it mostly it's been a good surprise. I don't think we've any had like a disappointing surprise, um, you know. But uh, the Doyle signing for me is definitely one of the more surprising ones. Um, Tony Walls definitely a, a a good surprise. But the rest of you guys chime in. Who surprised you? I, th- I think for me, it's it's easily Andrew Wheeler Amanu out at Tucson, just because, I mean, he was he was getting a, a lot of run out with Atlanta United too, and even getting some uh, some bench start and and some playing time with the senior team. So, and when he did, he was impressive. So it's imp- I think I mentioned that earlier. Like it's surprising to me that he's at League One level. Yeah, for me, um, there's a player. Um, Name uh, Josiel Nunez or Josiel Nunez uh, for Ford Madison, Panamanian national team player, 26. He's in his prime. He's a game changer. He just played in the CONCACAF Champions League last year and had a goal and two assists in four games. And I'm completely shocked that this is not a player who was signed in USL Championship or MLS. This is a player who I can easily see going to an MLS team and coming off the bench and winning a starting spot. He is somebody who makes a difference, especially at a time where you need to make a difference. And when I saw that name, it was one of those things to where I had to double take to make sure I was like, oh, well, maybe someone has the same name as him. But no, it's I'm so happy to see a player like that in the league. Was shocked that he was picked up, a great pickup by Madison. And that's definitely a player that I don't think is going to be in the league long. I think he's going to come in dominate and really open the eyes to some other teams out there. I said, Jason, I'll direct this, the, the next uh, two to you. I'll combine them just because you're giving them some love tonight. Um, why is Lansing Ignite the best USL one club and why <laughs> is the line SG the best supporters group? Well, you know, Lansing Ignite, I, I, they might be the best club. They, You know, it's cold in the winter, so a scarf might help, you know, convince me that they are if they want to send one over. But uh, no, like I said, I think um, I think with the assembly line, their supporters group is doing Lansing is great. Um, Like I said, if you haven't checked out, they do a column. I think it's weekly to where they uh, sit down with the players and do an interview so the fans can get to know the players before the season even starts. Um, I think them and the flock for Madison have definitely been the two supporters group who are really uh, showing that they are getting behind this team and are setting up this team for a great season. Yeah. And, and I know that we've been teasing about teams, but we truly do love all the teams equally. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, it's sort of like a parent thing where like, we all have our favorites, but we won't leave, you know, which ones except for Jason. <laughs> <laughs> whoever's bringing home you know the better grades that's going to be my favorite child right that's the one i'm i'm putting more investment in come on now i'm not <laughs> not putting money after in d's you know d's get- <laughs> all right guys um there, there was a couple other questions but um i'll, I'll just get to, to one more one for, for sake of time it was uh what's the best league one fun news of the week I'm going to say this just because it didn't come out this week, but I never knew. I'm going to ask you guys. I completely missed this announcement. Did you guys know that Gooch Oweyu is the sporting and technical director at Orlando B? Nope. It's pretty cool, though, huh? (laughs) Yeah, I had no idea 
that he was the uh, sporting technical director. And I think that's super cool. This is a guy who's been in the U.S. circuit, you know, for a while and he's got connections. So it's going to be interesting to see him develop these kids and also what kind of, you know, kids that he's bringing in from loan that he's might have seen during his travels or that he has buddies that are talking to saying like, hey, you should check out this kid. Yeah, I thought that was super cool. And I'm, I'm excited to see what kind of players Orlando is going to roll out because of it. Hey, man, it would be interesting to see how well he does as a coach. You know, he's such a, a legend of a player in, in U.S. soccer. So, yeah, it would be cool to see how oh, he does if, as a coach. If Orlando B does not end the season with the most yellow cards, I'm extremely <laughs> disappointed. <laughs> I am so disappointed. We need some bruisers at yes, this position. Yes, I need, I need late tackle FC. <laughs> I, I, I need it. I need it. They, yep. yeah, I will be sorely disappointed if I do not see those cards at the end of the season. <laughs> Chris or Mark? Go, go ahead, Chris. Uh, man, my favorite news from the league of the week. I don't even know. I mean, I, I guess I, you know, I'm so, I'm so in my bubble down here in Greenville. Um, I think one thing that's exciting for me is our supporters group, the Reedy River Riot, are kind of doing their launch event. Um, on Saturday and we found out that the team is actually going to be announcing their next player there. So that's kind of cool. I'm going to be doing a live podcast there for, yeah, that soccer show and recording and coach Harks is going to be there. It's at an indoor soccer place. So I'm really hoping I can get him out on the pitch and just like, just to say that I had played soccer with John Harks would, you know, that's, that's my big news really. That's what I'm trying to pull off. Not, not the Greenville baby apparel. How is that not your your biggest news of the week? I actually, <laughs> I actually got my, uh, you know, I've got a baby on the way in about seven weeks, and I got my onesie. Uh, one of one of uh, one of my fellow fans in town bought me the Greenville Triumph onesie for the baby. So we'll we'll be decking her out here in a couple of weeks. <laughs> For me, I think it's just it's the signings finally happening, uh, and, and you know, one step closer to real soccer being played. We have we have actual games going on this week and next week uh, for Phoenix and Tucson, and so it, it's been a long, I mean, not cold winter in Phoenix, but it's been a long winter, and we're I'm excited for uh, everything to be back. Yeah, for for me, it's 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 been all the signings and. Uh, also, just all the interaction, all of the hype that all the fan bases have been going on, all the teams have been going on. I think that, uh, especially with this cold weather, we're antsy to get the soccer season going. Uh, so, so that's that's all good news, uh, guys. Before we get out of here for the night, uh, let's let's give ourselves a little plug. You know, who to follow your podcast, anything like that. Uh, Chris, since you're new, we'll leave you have the honors. Go first. Yeah, you can uh, you can follow the podcast account. It's YTSS Podcast. Uh, yeah, that soccer show. You can we're on all the platforms. So go check us out. Mark, uh, you can find me uh, at Miracles, and then I uh, cover soccer not just for Tucson but the whole state at Firebird Soccer. Jason, we'll go with you. Uh, find me on Twitter at Home Sweet Soccer, um, and you can find some interviews, articles that I do on homesweetsoccer.com. And you can also, you know, make sure that you follow me on Twitter to see these spicy soccer hot takes that we're going to have. You know, um, one I'm going to go ahead on this show and say, because Orlando hasn't really announced too many signings, I'm going to go ahead right now, put my Nostradamus hat on and say that. I think they're going to sign or announce soon uh, Benji Mitchell or Mitchell. Um, they've already announced him to a homegrown contract, uh, played for University of Portland and killed it there. Um, he scored 31 goals and 51 starts, hitting double digits in each season. Um, second team, All-American. He's a beast, um, played in their academies back. Um, yeah, I think that that's going to be – announcement that i'm waiting for and if i'm right i expect every single last one of you guys to tweet me on twitter and praise me for it (laughs) 
All right, all right. Uh, and you can find me at Plaid Pirate on Twitter, and then also um, I do articles and interviews on USL News um, for USL Championship teams. Um, all right, guys, we made it through second second podcast. Hopefully, second of many more. Uh, before I forget, uh, shout out to our sponsor, Roughneck Scars. Uh, as always, make sure to follow us at USL One Fire. Sorry, League One Fire. I'm getting. I'm doing the wrong. Uh, <laughs> here. Make sure you follow USL uh, League One as well, and make sure you follow uh, League One Fun. Um, may you know every Wednesday night, or most Wednesday nights, we're gonna at least try to be on here doing the live stream around nine, and then uh, I know on Spotify and Stitcher, hopefully, you can hear us within uh, the the next day or two. Um, but all right, guys, thank you for all the love and support, and we'll see you guys next week.